All right, so we're just going to pull up the Power Options screen as the questions come in for our open discussion forum. And it looks like the first question has come in from, uh, I'm sorry, here, let me get the name right, uh, Devendra. And Devendra asks, when to use 5, 15, 60 minutes chart? Uh, how long those charts are good for swing trading? What minute chart should we use? Okay. I don't really do swing trading or day trading with options. Um, by the way, I have something interesting to, to show you all. Many of you already know this, but it caught us, didn't catch us off guard, and I just realized it the other day, okay? Um, but Devendra, if you're swing trading, if you're doing daily trades, whether with options, which personally I do not do, um, but if you're you know just trying to move in and out day by day, um, I would suggest maybe the 15 minute. Uh, I know a customer that I've talked to who uses the 15 minutes, but if you're more just focusing on stocks uh, and doing things um, of that nature uh, as far as stocks go and you're trying to really, I don't want to say this, pinch the pennies, so to speak, um, so that you don't get uh, you know, caught uh, in different situations. You have a very restricted requirement of what you have for a gain and what you have for a limited loss, then I'd say the closer the time, the better. Now, on power options, when I'm typically looking at a security, uh, let me just go to um, FL today. That was had a little bit of fun. I'm just going to go to the quotes page here uh, for Foot Locker. Make sure the page adjusts. And anytime you see a position on a search or uh, you're researching it on the quotes page or on the option chain, you can use the More Information button and you can go to Big Charts. Now, big charts will allow you, of course, you might have your own charting system, uh, again, and uh, again, I'm not an expert at swing trading, I don't really do it, and I don't practice um, with the minute charts, honestly. I don't look at a daily chart for a particular stock, because that's not how I trade. But you can customize this, and I'm sure, uh, Devendra, you probably have your own charting system and what you look to do. But you can set this up to look at the uh, one minute, five minute and 15 minute and again for what you're doing you may want to even look at the one minute I don't know what your restrictions are what your goals are uh, as far as when to get out of a position for the profit you're looking for or what loss limit you're using well I'm gonna go with a five minute here and I'm gonna set up a time it only lets me go to three days I think yeah go one day two day five days and ten days there was a three day in there but let's just stick with the five days on a five minute chart and I'm not going to look at anything else. I'm not going to look at MACD or Bollinger Bands or anything. Let's just go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's, that's too much there. Let's just look at the one day for us. Okay, we'll look at a five-minute chart. Okay, see, so there's a couple of spikes here. Um, you know, from the 9.30 in the morning over here when the Foot Locker was opened, we had some spikes here in the five-minute intervals. Now, let's say that uh, we were thinking it was going on a run, and we got in maybe here. But then we may, you know, based on what your loss limit is, would this be too much? You know, you maybe got in at, let's call it 69.30. I think I was, uh, yeah, that was about the high this morning, 69.30 at this point here. But then the drop down here was probably at 68.90. So it's only 40 cents. But if that's what you're kind of doing here to isolate this, you know, is five minutes enough? I don't know. You might want to go to one minute depending on how tight your restrictions are. Of course, if you got in here, you'd probably want to close at this point. Um, really, the target would be maybe, don't want to call that like a cup and handle, but if you got in on either of these lows, you did pretty well, though it did close down towards the end of the day. But we had a nice uh, surprise run on this stock. It didn't, yeah, never breached, what was the high today? I'm sorry. Well, that's the 52-week range. Okay, it didn't break it down for, for the high for today for me. But let's just take a look at the one-minute chart, Devendra. I don't know if that's going to help you see that. That to me is a lot of noise. Um, if I could go half a day maybe, but that seems like a lot of noise in there. So the five minute looks more crisp to me, but again, it depends on how you like to analyze the charts on those positions and uh, also how you like to evaluate the different positions. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the best advice I can give. I would start with the five minute. Um, I, I guess that's just the way I view it. I kind of like that look. But depending, again, on how tight your restrictions are and how you're looking at those positions and what your ranges are for those, you might want to take a look, okay? All right, so let's see here. Okay, let me clear up some of this. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll check in a second to see this mic. Okay. Let's see, Martin. Okay. Um, let me, I'm going to save this question that came in from Bob. Um, 
let me take a look here at the attendees. I apologize, folks. Bob was, was writing in and saying that he wasn't getting any sound. Uh, Bob looks like you're back in now. Uh, hopefully that you have sound there. So I'll, I'll check that in just a moment. Uh, but I'll save your question until I'm positive you've come back in because I've seen you've backed out a couple times and you finally got sound. Okay. All right. So let's take Bob's question now that he's back. Okay. So it says option durations and volatility tools. How is IV related to duration of the trades. Okay. Well, one of the signature tools that we offer on Power Options, of course, is the volatility skew tool. All right. And you can look at the volatility skew either by strike or by time. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look at Apple. And I'm going to go to the October 28th expiration. And then you can settle it for just the chain. Okay. So this is going to show you if there's a skew or a smile in volatility. Okay, for the implied volatility for the options. And in both cases, here's the at the money strike. It's kind of trying to form a smile here for the calls, but the puts are showing more of just kind of a straight skew downwards here. Okay, so where the, the in the money puts have a lower implied volatility than the out of the money puts. And the implied volatility is double what we'd see for a normal Apple option. And the reason why is because earnings are coming out on October 27th. So we see, you know, the deep in the money call here at 0.43 and 0.33 for the deep out of the money call. But the out the money is around 0 0.29, 0 0.28, which is about the average, but it's a little high. So if I go out to December, for example, and this is just the strike skew for a specific expiration, what we see here is that the at the money is at 0 0.22. That is significant, you know, from 0.22 to 0.29. It doesn't seem like that much, but it will drastically increase the value of the option. But of course, then we go to the deep in the money options, of course, to 22 and a half all the way out to Jan uh, December here. And, you know, they're so high because there's, you know, just a lot of things there, okay? Um, do you always expect to see an increased volatility when you go further out in time? Well, we can check the time skew, okay? And you can, on the time skew view, on the volatility skew, you can look at the at the money strike or you can look at any of the strikes if you want to look at in the money or out of the money. Let's just look at the at the money for right now. And you see the close in ones, well today's is at 0 0.02. Next week's at 0 0.16, it's pretty low. October 21st, 0.17. Why are those so low? It's because the event is here. That's why they're at 0.29. Now it starts to go up higher as we go further out in time. This is January 2018 at 0.26 and January 2019 at 0.28. Everywhere else in the middle here, you know, it's in that 0.2 to 0.3 range. And usually you don't expect the, if you go very far out in time, yes, you'd expect the implied volatilities to increase. But normally the shorter options that are going to be affected the most by the event, which are these three, four series here, are going to have the highest implied volatility. But the average around Apple is about 0.22. These two are low. The next two weeks expirations implied volatility are low because all the money is going into the anticipation of the earnings coming out on the 27th and focusing on the 28th, the day after, the Friday expiration after that earnings event happens as well. Okay, so I mean, what can you expect for the duration? Well, it also varies from stock to stock. You look at some of those large biotech stocks where the market knows that a phase two or phase three drug trial is coming out, let's say in mid-November or early December, you're going to see a spike in volatility at that point. But normally what you expect to see is a trailing off, but it all depends on market conditions. See here, we're really low in this time frame, and the spike is due to the earnings event. If there was no earnings event coming up, this would probably be around 0.7, then we'd see maybe 0.18, and then 0.19, maybe 0.2, and so forth. But each stock is different. Let's check out Foot Locker. And because we're in an earnings season, we're going to see a spike on most of these positions. But let's take a look at the time skew for Foot Locker at the 70 strike. Okay, so 11.18, this doesn't offer weekly options. Foot Locker does not offer weekly options. So the spike is here, but then it settles back down to the norm. And then as we start going further out in time, it increases just because of the, especially out to January 2018, just as we saw with Apple, it goes up because, well, the unexpectedness of the time frame going further out, going that far out, no one knows what's going to happen, so there's some inherent risk there. But, you know, the one month out after the earnings and so forth, you'll see it right about the average there, okay? And, of course, remember, anytime you're researching an option, let me go to, oh, let's go to Apple, though. As we were talking about that, let's just go to the chain very quickly. 
And I'm going to go to just the call chain. And we're going to go to October 28th. Earnings, oh, I'm sorry, the earnings, someone reminded me of this last week, the 25th, uh, they changed it to the 25th now, but it's still the 28th is going to be the most affected. But when you're looking at an option, if you go to research here from the option chain or whether you're on the search, go to research, and then we can go to call research or put research. And what you'll see here is all the data that we have for this particular option. And then down below, you'll see a graph of the historical values of the option price, but you can look at time value, delta, open interest, bid ask, uh, volume, for example, stock price, and so forth. But here it's just showing the bid versus the implied volatility. And this option has remained fairly stable over time. And it just spiked up, let's see, right about in two eight point yeah, when it first opened is at point two two around the average, but it spiked up on nine twelve and we got about 40 days, 45 days into the earnings, or towards the earnings when the earnings date was released. But any option you look at, you can scan through and see what the historical implied volatility was on the call or the put research tool, which you can link to from the chain. Okay. All right, Mike says, when do you bail out from a covered call? Do you use stops even with married puts? Okay, I don't use stops. Hold on one second. Let me just scroll down. Oh, and, and Bob, follow up for Bob. He says, I trade options on futures, not stocks. Will this also work using your software? Unfortunately, Bob, uh, we don't have the data for the futures options. We just track the indexes, ETFs, the U.S. indexes, and ETFs as well. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, so let's go to Mike's question now. When do you bail out of a covered call position? Do you use stops even with married puts? Okay, well, let's... Take a look at one of my positions that I was in. It was with a Mary put. We're going to treat it, Mike, as just a covered call. So let's go to the custom spread tool. Okay. And let's see, GT. And we're going to put in shares of stock, 100. And I guess a cost basis of 31.85. And we had sold the 32 call for today for $1.08. All right, so I'm just going to pull up this covered call position here. Now, let's say that this was my covered call. And, you know, the stock's at 32.83. But as we did before, let me go and take a look at the stock chart. Let's say that I open this position, Mike, probably back, um, let's say I opened it, whatever, three weeks ago, at September expiration, okay? Now, what I want to do is I'm going to go to big charts. And if I'm in a spread position or a covered call position, let's just go one month. Okay. There we go. So, okay, so let's say that we open the position right around the September time frame when the stock was roughly at around 31.85 or so. Okay, we got in around here. And we sold that 32 and we were looking for a 4% return. Now, here's the question that you have to ask yourself first. What are your goals? for covered calls in your portfolio. I'm not going to get into any discussion about the risks of covered calls and why I use uh, radioactive trades or collar positions. But this is a 4% yield for roughly, let's say, a 20-day trade. Okay, if I did get a dollar eight for it. So we're looking at about a 4% yield. Now, what are you using covered calls for? And you're using it for monthly or weekly return. I understand that. But you have to ask yourself, is it worth it to roll this position or is it better just to let it get assigned, take your 4%, and then on Monday run a new search and find the three or four, maybe five or 10 other positions that match your criteria, okay? So is your goals to hold stocks long-term in your portfolio and generate monthly income against them and collect a dividend? You know, selling out of the money calls. If that's the case, then what I would typically do is when the stock goes, the option goes slightly in the money maybe 1% or so. So if this stock went up to 32.30 or 32.35, that's when I would have looked to roll the 32, maybe up to the 33, or maybe up to the 34, depending on what I could get for the premium and depending on how it affected my position. Okay. Now, so that being said, if you're very protective of your positions, meaning you don't want to risk getting them called away, I'm taking this, Mike, as 
I opened this covered call on or around September 15th, and I was happy with the 4% gain if I got a science day on October 7th. However, if I thought this stock had more room to run, I thought it had more legs to run, then I may look to buy to close the call again when the stock's maybe 1% in the money, it's about 32.20, 32.30, something along those lines, and maybe look to roll up in price. Ernie might even let it go a little bit more. You know, he might, if, especially if you're dealing with dollar strikes, he let, might let it go to the halfway point at 32.50 and then look to roll then so he can at least get a decent premium for the 33. And here's what I mean. If the stock with these weekly options and these dollar strike differences, let's just take a look here. So the stock's at 32.85, 32.83. It's, let's just say it's right around $33 per share. So if I decided to buy this call back today and I wanted to go to the 34 call, not the 33, but I wanted to go to the 34 call to give more room for October 14th, well, that's only 10, 15 cents. Okay, it's, it's not gonna be really worth it to me to roll to that position. This offers 50 cent strike differences, which makes it even more complicated. Um, so where I'm going with that is that it depends. Now, I'd have to maybe go out further. If I go to November 4th weekly series, which is 28 days away, I can get 60, 70 cents for that 34 call, which might make the buyback a little bit more feasible. The buyback was about 90 cents today, okay, it's for that call. I was hoping it was going to pull back, maybe only be trading around 32.40, 32.30 or so, but it didn't. It went up a little bit more and was at 32.83, okay? So when do you bail out from a covered call? Okay, well, when a call for me goes slightly in the money by about 1% or so, that's when I might look to roll to the position. That being said, okay, Keep in mind that if I decided to say, let's say the stock goes to 32.10 and it's just hovering there for a couple days, it's very unlikely that I'll see early assignment without an ex-dividend date coming up or without another event coming up that might cause someone to uh, assign my stock early if it's only 10 cents or 15 cents in the money. But the key to remember is that you can be assigned anytime if your short call is in the money. So if you really want to protect this position but when the stock gets up to 32 or a little bit above 32, you might want to consider rolling it. If let's say you have a large holding and you have a very low cost basis in a cash account and you want to avoid tax consequences, when it goes up to 32 or you know 3205, you might want to roll it just so you don't risk early assignment on that position. Okay. Um, so number one, if the call is roughly about 1% in the money or so, that's when I'd look to roll the position. This also applies, as you mentioned, Mike, you know, do you use stops even with wearing puts? This is the same way. I approach having a married put and a short call against it. The call goes 1% in the money, I'll look to roll it. Okay, number two, an event is coming up. Let's say for an example, we didn't sell this October 7th, let's say this was the October 14th, and either an earnings date was coming up on October 12th, or an ex-dividend date, and my stock's right sort of at the money, okay? So if I'm approaching an ex-dividend date or an earnings date, before the expiration of my call, I may look to roll the call further out, or if in the case of the earnings, I may just look to buy it back and leave the upside open, and you know, add a put to it so I have a married put position, um, and then if the stock does gap up, I can sell a higher strike call without having to pay the six, seven, eight dollars to buy back my call premium. Uh, some investors will use um, stock criteria, okay, to look to roll a call you know, once it starts to move up in price, okay? So let's say I had opened a position and, uh, you know, at the time I'd done the research and analysis on it, I was looking for a delta of 0.4 to 0.6. Well, now if the delta of the position went up and my delta goes to 0.7 or 0.8, that might be one of my exits, okay? But if, you know, if you use delta as an entry point, you might want to use the delta as an exit. Um, on the other range of that other stock criteria, time value is an important one. Ernie and I usually close our calls, whether it's in the money or whether it's fallen in price and you know it's further out of the money, it's going to expire worthless. We usually buy back the call when we have maybe, well, we could look at this one or two ways. It's a terrible drawing, sorry. When we have less than 1% of time value, I'm actually about, if it's less than 0.7, you know, 0.7% or 0.8% of time value. And then, of course, another popular one is the 80% rule. So if I sold this call for $1.08, GT had pulled back as I expected, and then yesterday or the day before, I could have bought it back for $0.20 cents and made 80% of what I expected to make. That's when I looked to buy back the call. Okay, or here's my return of 4%. If on Thursday, 
or on Wednesday when the stock was trading up at above you know 3250 3260 if I could have liquidated a couple days early and taken a 3.7 or maybe a 3.9 percent profit off the table made 80 percent of what I expected I'd make on the position that's when I would look to do it okay how about the downside you know that's talking about on the upside when I'd look to manage the call how about on the downside well on the downside I usually look for the next strike but I'm a little bit more lenient especially in this position okay what do we mean by next strike well with 50 cent strike differences I kind of throw this idea that I use on other positions out the window <laughs> and what I mean by that is that the um, so it's a dollar strike difference so if I saw the stock drop down you know I got in about 32 if the stock dropped below 31 I might buy to close the 32 call and sell the 31 for more protection you know roll it down Eh, I don't know if I would do that with dollar strikes. I might let it go a little bit farther, because keep in mind I collected a dollar eight, so my break even is really thirty seventy seven. So in this case, if I see the stock drop below the break even, let's say it went to thirty seventy five, that's when I might consider buying to close the thirty two. Again, only if it makes sense. If something happened in the market where this you know during this trade GT dropped down to thirty seventy seven and the volatility index went up, or the volatility across the market went up, and the premium to buy this back was actually 80 cents, I'm probably not gonna do it. If I'm concerned about the downside, I'm probably doing something else, right? You're probably buying a put at that time if you're concerned about it falling further. Rolling down the call and not making at least 50, 60% of what you expected to make on the short call to begin with that you originally sold might not be a good idea. I probably want more time value to decay out of this into my favor before I consider rolling it down to a lower strike price. And of course, it's fair to say that, you know, because the volatility spike, this option is increased and the 30 strike to be defensive, or maybe even the 31 strike would also have increased in value to make that easier. If you hold a covered call or an unprotected stock position through earnings and the stop gaps down 20% or so, and it's trading at low levels, well, would you roll at that time? You could, but now you can't risk the stock rebounding. So if GT dropped six and a half points roughly, let's say it was trading at around $26 per share after earnings come out on that uh, October 12th date. That's not the actual earnings, I'm just using it as an example. Let's say GT took its 20% hits trading at 26, and this is my original cost basis of 30.77. Well, I might be able to sell the 27 call now, maybe for the 4th of November, maybe for the 11th of November, maybe for the standard November expiration, and get another dollar, of course, to lower my cost basis down to 29.77. Okay, but I'm selling a 27 call. So what I can't risk is the stock recovering and now going back up to 27 and 28 because I'm gonna get assigned for a $2.77 loss. Now I'm gonna have to pay more money to buy back this call to roll back up to the 28 or 29 strike, and now my cost base is probably gonna go back to the 30.77. Okay, so those are some of my ideas there on when I look to manage a covered call or a covered call that I have inside the married put position. Do I use stops with the married put? Absolutely not, because I manage the married put. Okay, and what I mean by that is if I open a new married put position today, whether I'm selling a call, planning on selling a call against it in the next 30 to 60 days or doing another income method, here's the thing. This isn't a great position, but let's say, not that the stock's bad, but Sometimes these lower price stocks are, are hard to make money on with radioactive trades. I've done well in a lot of them, but some of them have been just slow movers. In any case, we could buy match group at 1722. And the put that came up that matched the radioactive trading criteria would be the May 20th at 440. Okay, so am I using a stop to get out of this trade? Well, no, because what I look to do following the rules in the blueprint is if a certain thing happens, one direction or the other, so let's say the stock drops a certain percentage, I'm gonna consider now my SEGA model. What are the current conditions and what are my expectations going forward? Rather than just say, nope, I'm out, I'm done, I'm gonna say, okay, well, if I think the stock's gonna recover, I'm gonna to look to adjust this put. Or I might do an income method number 12. If the stock moves up to, let's say, 1850 or 19, well, I might look to sell a call or do something else as far as one of the riskless spread trades goes inside the radioactive trading techniques. Okay, but I don't use a stop in that scenario. Because, you know, I'm comfortable with the 7.5% risk. And remember, that's the worst case scenario. Really would only happen if I held this position all the way to March expiration, accepted no dividends and did no adjustments, and the stock was below 20. So if I'm comfortable with that, if the stock falls 20% because of earnings in the next couple of weeks or so, next 30 days, 
and I can get out of the position with a 4 or 5% loss because I don't think it's going to recover, that's fine. I mean, that's a drastic. You could say that that is a stop order. Your, your stock's down 20%, but it's not just that. If my stock fell 20% because of earnings, but I think it's an overreaction and it is going to come back up in price, I'm going to look to stay in the position. I'm going to look to adjust my insurance policy, which is really a second asset, not an insurance policy. Okay? Ah, oh, geez, Martin, I don't have a great answer for you, and I do apologize for that. <laughs> I haven't tracked these that much, and honestly, the surprise, uh, the movement in them the other day uh, here was very, not surprising to me, but it, it, it was against other things. All right, so Martin's question is, JNUG and the VIX have support levels near 10. That's right. Usually when we see the VIX drop to near 11, that's when we usually look to expect a change. Okay, that's one of the market sentiments. Uh, I'm sorry, that's one of the ones available, excuse me. One of the 13 factors that's used in the market sentiment tool. Okay, um, but the spreads are wide, of course. Spreads are always going to be wide on anything that's a three times bull or bear and the VIX as well. And remember, the VIX doesn't follow, the underlying price of the VIX is more of an estimation. The VIX really follows sort of the volatility futures uh, there and not really that other um, you know, the, the monetary value. What I mean is that the, if you have a VIX at 10 and you're looking at an 11 strike put, for example, it might not be priced at a dollar. It might be priced differently because it's not based on the underlying value you're seeing. It's based on the futures uh, conglomerate. Okay. Um, I don't trade these instruments at all. I don't, you know, VIX, I know a lot of investors use VIX to hedge their portfolio. They buy calls on the VIX uh, in case there's a market decline. I don't really do that because 60% of my portfolio is in married puts and collar spreads, so I'm already protected and hedged out. I don't need to worry about a market correction uh, in that sense uh, for most of my portfolio. Okay, the VIX. I would agree with you. Let's just you know, one thing that you can see here. You go to the. Um, I'm sorry, not the volatility skew. Let's go to the market sentiment tool very quickly. These are all the indicators that we have, and the VIX is in a bearish mode. Why? Because as Martin mentioned, it's down near its lower levels, and usually when it hits this price, it has a very low frequency of staying below that range. Okay? So, let's take a look at the histogram. When you go into details for any of the 13 indicators, what you're seeing here is the total number of occurrences where the VIX has ever reached 11 over, I think, the last eight or nine years. Okay, and then here it's only reached 10.4% of the time, a value of 10. And right now we're at 12, oh no, we're at 1348. But that's still a bearish because very rarely, less than 10% of the time, do you see it over the last eight, nine years, less than 10% of the time, 7.7 .7 and 2.4. Okay, so it's 11.4% it's of the time, roughly, if you add all three of those up. Only 11.4% of the time over the last eight years has the VIX dropped below this range of uh, 13. Has it ever dropped below 13? It's in the 13 range now, it's in the mid range, but it is going lower, okay? Or it has been. So that's kind of the catch there as to what to look for. What to look for? Yeah, you can use this distribution as almost a gauge of what you should expect when you see certain things. And of course, you can also look at it versus the SPX, but that might drive you bonkers going all the way. Okay, so it's eight years, I'm sorry, it's all the way back to 2008. So it's eight years of historical plots. Anytime the VIX hit, 9, 10, 11, and never hit 9. You know, it's a 10, 11, 12, and so forth, all the way up to 32, 33, 34. So what to look out for? I don't really know. You know, but this case, yeah, I'm expecting the VIX to go back up. Now, am I saying the VIX is going to go to 20, or it's going to go to 25 next week? We're going to have a large run. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that I wouldn't be surprised if sometime next week there's a pullback in the market, and we saw it maybe go back up to 14 or 15. Okay, um, it might hover around 1350 to 1450 for the next one week or two weeks. Really, it's going to pan out when the big companies start reporting their earnings, of course, and everyone gets a better gauge of what the economy is really doing and who's getting matching or who's missing what they're expected. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm sorry, next question. I just wanted to read through it before I got there. I'm gonna, Dan, I'm going to go fast forward very quickly. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, Scott, yeah, I can address that in a little bit. Um, I, I'm going through uh, fast forwarding here to see if anyone had comments of that um, on the discussion. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Let's see. I'm sorry, folks. Just give me one second. Okay, Sam is, had mentioned he'd rather buy a call and sell two calls. Yeah, I talked about that on Wednesday's webinar, how that gets you into the infinite risk, or if you do the ratio backspread, the pros and cons about that. Okay. All right. Oh, and Mike says, yeah, and then the question was about the downside. Of course, we talked about both. Do you campaign covered calls married puts on a declining stock? Not really. Um, if I'm in a married put and it starts to drop, okay, Mike, it starts to fall down in price, then I'll look to add protection or I'll look to uh, just maybe buy a put on it if I'm tracking a stock that's going down in price, okay? Um, or I might do a bear call credit spread whether I'm in a married put or not, but I might just do a bear call credit spread as the stock's falling. But yeah, if I don't think the stock's going to recover, if I'm in a declining stock, I have to decide, and you have to decide as well, okay? You have to decide for yourself, Mike, what loss you're willing to take on any position and stay with it. Don't outthink yourself. If you set your stop, whether it's a mental stop or whether it's a stop order, and I don't use stop orders, by the way, just because they are market orders, and they usually get me out of positions, and then I miss the next upside because it got triggered. You know, it could be triggered during the day, only the next day to see the stock move up three or four more points. I don't like not having that control. That's one of the reasons why I like married puts, because it is a stop, but I control it. I can decide when I get out of the position. The market's not dictating that for me if the stock has a bad day and then recovers three days later. Okay, um, so set a stop, set your trading plan and set a stop that works for you and adhere to it. Now, you're going to get burned with covered calls. You just are. Everyone is. Okay, and what I mean by that is if you have a position, a portfolio of 10 or 12 covered calls open and you're, or maybe even 8 or 10, even 2 or 3, but 8 or 10, okay, let's say, Mike, and you're rolling covered calls consistently month by month, whether you're letting them get assigned or whether you're rolling them in price or whether you're looking at new positions after the ones got assigned, you're going to have a stock that falls 20% overnight that gets stopped out. Okay, you're going to set your 7 or 8% stop order once every 8 or 9 months one of those stocks is going to drop gap down 20, 30 percent and you're going to get closed because the stop order is just a market order saying get me out of the position if it's ever below this price. So you have your stop order in at 7, 8 percent, market drops 25 or the stock drops 25 overnight, you wake up in the morning, they bought back your call, they closed your stock at the 25 percent loss. You're averaging 1 to 2 percent, maybe 2 percent yield on each position that you're getting assigned on or you're trying to roll for the 2% time premium and then one trade you just wiped out 10 previous 10 12 previous successful trades it's just going to happen and if you're doing a cash secured naked put it's just going to happen we can't control those aftermarket things poor reporting you know talk of a CEO leaving a company or anything like that boardroom discussion or you know if you're in a covered call and you don't want it to be assigned maybe they get a buyout offer and it moves up 15% you didn't want it to get assigned, but you were probably already called out at that point. Okay, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but that's just what you're going to have to go through. So what every covered call investor has gone through, and every naked put investor has gone through that too. It's just going to happen. Even if you go 15% out of the money with far out in time, out of the money naked put positions, it's going to happen. It happens to all of us. It happens to everyone. Okay. All right. Okay. So sorry, Dan. Let's get to your question now. Would like how you would analyze a strategy for a stock that has gone a split or through a reverse split. Okay, the options can get very calculated. For example, how would a straddle on a stock of your choice would have done if you entered 12 months ago? Okay, I have a rule about that. Um, if I know a stock split is coming up on a position that I'm in, I do close the position. Unless it's a standard 2 to 1 or 3 to 1. If it's a buyout, Dan, or if it's a merger where I know that, you know, when it's completed, that my holding would represent 100 or let's say 85 shares of this stock, 15 shares of this stock, and my call options now represent the 85 shares plus this amount of cash settlement. I honestly do not want to mess around with it. There's 4,200 other optionable stocks out there that do not have compulated calculations, so why make it harder on myself to do that? Okay, it has happened before where it just came out of nowhere and a company buyout merger happened and I was in a position and then eventually it, you know, when it got filled and I had to figure it all out. To be honest with you, it happened to me recently on SH, the short SPY position. I opened a position a little while ago on SH and I did not know. I didn't 
do enough due diligence. I could have found it had I dug more. I did a little bit, but not as much as I should have, I'll be honest with you. And they took on a two-to-one split, a reverse two-to-one split. Okay, so I can use SH as an example. And it was a nightmare for me, and it still is. I'm still holding it, but here's what happened. Okay, I took a position. I'm going to guess it here. Um, SH, I think I opened the position at... 100 shares at $20, and I think it was something weird, like $20.02 or $20.01, and I bought the February, maybe the November. This was a while ago. I bought the November, oh, they don't even show it anymore, so maybe it wasn't November, I apologize. No, it had to have been, okay, let's go to January. They're not showing it because um, they adjusted it, but what I did buy is I bought the November 1, I'm sorry, 1 January it was either a 20 or a 21 strike put. I can't remember. I think it was a 21 strike put. Okay, why, why is it not showing up there now? Here's what they did to me. So it was a reverse split on SH. And I now own 50 shares of SH. This is an easy one, too. <laughs> it was a reverse split, but I own 50 shares of SH with a cost basis of about, I think it was 40.10. So this must have been 20.05 when I got into the position. Okay. So let's say 05. So my new cost base is 50 shares at 40.10. But what they didn't do, because they can't do it, I can't own half of a put. So instead of now showing me that I had the 41.50 put, uh, or I'm sorry, the 40.50 put, you know, because of the spread here, the 40, I'm sorry, the 42 put against this position with a 21 strike, or 21 strike, yeah, I still own one put at the 21 strike. So now I have 50 shares of stock and a put at the 20 strike, which represents one half of a put at the 40 strike. This is ridiculous. Okay, so have I closed the position? No. Because why? Well, you see it. We all know what the market's done over the past two and a half months. I was expecting some correction soon, but it stayed right around here. You know, it dropped, and it's been around 37, then up to 38 to 39, but it hasn't gone back above 40 yet. I'm waiting for this to go above break even, and I'm going to sell to close the stock, those 50 shares, just to get out of it, because I do not want to add another 50 shares at 38.29, which wouldn't be a bad idea. I'd lower my cost basis down to 39, but then figure out, you know, do I sell to close my 20 put and then buy a 40 put? Had I done a strangle, okay, if I had done 10 contracts of a strangle, let's say at the 20, or straddle, I'm sorry, Let's say we did a straddle for maybe November with the 20 strikes, which aren't showing up. But let's say we did it the 30 at the time, and we did 10 contracts. Sorry, folks. There we go. So we did 10 contracts of a straddle back then before split. You know, these wouldn't have been the prices because when it was at 20, this would have been 5 cents. This would have been 15 cents, of course. But... You know, now it's it's not that I have a profit because I don't own 10 contracts of the 30 call anymore, right? I own five contracts of the 45 that's out of the money. And I own five contracts of the 45 put, which is essentially in the money, right? Because of the reverse split, in that case, the two-to-one split, okay? So how do we play it? I, Ernie and myself, Dan, will typically close a position. If something happens, there's a merger, there's a buyout, um, there's an odd split, a three to two, a seven to five, you know, anything like that. He and I just have a tendency to liquidate the position when it's available. Okay. Oh, you're saying MYI agrees to pay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Sam. That was a different topic. My apologies. Okay. So that's what I was looking for on that position, and that's what you'd expect to see. I do not play splits. I know that some investors try to play splits the way they think that, well, if it's a two-to-one split, the stock's going to recover afterwards because they're going to increase their uh, you know, market cap, be able to, to get more buyers in at the lower price, and it's going to be more attractive. Not every stock goes up after a split, okay? So I don't play it that way either after the fact. Um, but in my opinion, any time I see a contract, I'm in a position where it goes to an odd-sized contract because of a merger or adjustment, I just get out of it. Okay. All right. Okay. So now we want to talk about some tools here. Jim unfortunately left. I think he, he asked a question about 15, 20 minutes ago, but I, I think he left. He had to log off. He's using power options. How do you find candidates to sell options using a spread? Okay. Well, it's very simple. 
any of the vertical spreads are supported, right? Bear call credit, let's go to other strategies here. I'm recording this so you can view it later. We've got bear call credit, and we can add in the bull put credit, okay? And the debit spreads as well are also listed. I'm sorry, your bull call debit and your bear put debit. Now, if I'm looking for new positions in any strategy, whether it's a credit spread or a debit spread, if I'm just looking across the universe of options to find good positions, I'm just going to go to bull put credit. I'll go into search. Based on the discussion we've had with the VIX and some of the other market sentiment tools there, I probably should be looking at bear calls right now. But I'll just go to bull puts and I'll go to search. Now, this pulled up the default criteria that Ernie tested for weekly bull put spreads. And you'd say, okay, well, I'm looking at these spreads and I see the standard expiration, which is 14 days out in time. That's not a weekly search. Well, with Ernie's testing, he actually found out that long-term, using certain sets of criteria, he got a better average return going more than 10 days out in time, not going seven days, seven days, or five days, five days, five days. For the spread positions, he maximized what he felt was the returns that he could do best with, with tweaking the criteria, um, going eight to, eight to 15 days out, eight to 17 days out, I think, is the criteria. Yeah, eight to 17 days out in time. So this is our weekly search, but we're not looking week by week because we found better long-term to use the 14-day out with the set of criteria, okay? These are not recommendations or suggestions. So when you pull up the search, you want to scroll down below. You can see exactly what filters we're using and what filters are available. So this particular position, search, excuse me, is looking for options that expire 8 to 17 days away, minimum net credit of 15 cents, at least a 2% return, Short put has to be 3% of the money. We want a probability of better than 70 and some basic liquidity. We want stocks trading in an uptrend because we're in the bull put spread it. And we're using the MACD value for stocks trading above the MACD, or the MACD has crossed the signal line in at least three days. And of course, we're avoiding stocks between now and expiration, I'm sorry, that have earnings between now and expiration. But if your criteria that you dictate says that you only want to see positions that have a probability of 78% or higher, well, you just want to make that change. Okay, so we'll just make that change and run that. Now the system is going through every, just about every possible bull put spread, credit spread combination. We've narrowed it down to only 23 spreads that match that base criteria and the adjustment. If you want to use other fundamentals or technicals, you can put those in as well. Okay, so that's how you find spreads. If you know the stock already, you want to find spreads on Apple, you can use the search by symbol tool. This just requires you to put in your stock symbol and your expiration date. Let's go to the week. Uh, let's go to all weeklies here. I'll go to more results. And so this will break down a variety of spread positions: seven days out, 21 days out, and so forth. Okay, 14 days out as well. But this is a lot to go through, and you can't filter it on the search by symbol tool other than by changing the date and if you want uh, the expiration date and if you want less, more all results. A better tool to use to find vertical spreads credit spreads and debit spreads one stock at a time is the spread chain, which is available in the signature tools, but it's also available under any of the credit spreads. And what this allows us to do is put in our symbol, and I'll say, let's say we're bullish. I'm going to put in put credit and call debit parity. We'll put in Apple, and let's go to the, let's go to the four, seven day out one, okay? But you see here, what I can do now is put in base requirements. I can tell that I want to see two point spreads. I want a minimum 15 cent net credit. And let's say your probability was 74%. Okay, so we go ahead and submit that. And for the expiration we selected, okay, nothing's there. So I've got to restrict this a little bit. Let's narrow that down and uh, my return at 2% out of the money range. Okay, so let's submit that again. There we go, okay. So the probability shift there. So the 110, 112 bull put spread it's only giving me a 20 cent net credit, but it's 11.1% yield on my two point spread, and I have a 72% probability. So why aren't the other ones showing up? Okay, why is the 110, 112 the only spread that's shown? Well, okay, if we looked at the further out of the money puts, we're not gonna be getting the credit we want. We'd get the probability, but we want the credit. If we go higher, you know, to say, well, what about the 113, 111 two-point spread or the 114, uh, you know, other one? Well, that's not going to have the probability we want, okay? So based on your restrictions, you can plug in spread width, minimum credit, out of the money range, return, 
and probability. And for your stocks, this will show you just those spreads that match that criteria, and it's using midpoint pricing uh, to calculate the net credit, which also would be used for the return as well. Okay, so anytime you want to find new positions, you're going to use the search. Use our default settings as a stepping stone to create your own personal search. You can use the search by symbol tool, but I find it more beneficial to use the spread chain in that scenario. Okay, all right. Scott says, if you can disclose the finding of GT, and did you do it through one of the search tools? Uh, yeah, I can. This is the Fusion subscription. I'm logged on to my Fusion account. And let me go into the open trades position. And let's scroll down to GT. This is in my portfolio. Made the roll today. And so the first trade was made on March 2nd, 2016. Stock was at 31.35 when I got in. Okay. And here's the brief, Scott. Here's the new RPM for Goodyear Tire and Rubber. It appeared in the Power Options Married Put Search, which uses the default radioactive criteria that's discussed in the blueprint to find the positions. And of course, so it was in the Fusion Report as well. Uh, during Friday's open discussion, I was asked why do not do RPMs on such as Amazon, Apple, and Google. That's because of position size, trade allocation, and uh, I had mentioned that I may open an RPM at the time on GT or Dean Foods, and that was from 3-2, 2016, when I opened this position. So GT, Dean Foods, Nuance, or Agilent. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So looking at the charts, the other factors with earnings that were coming up, I decided to go with GT. Okay? So we made some adjustments over time, sold some, some calls, rolled up the put, sold some calls against it. I ended up rolling the call and the put or rolling the put back down again. Did an income method number five on the position as well. And we've collected dividends in here during that time, I believe, also. Okay, so let's go back to GT. Let's go ahead and draw the chart there. I'm going to go to, yeah, it's going to have to be, we're, yeah, whoop, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong thing, folks. i got to go back to one year and daily. Okay, so, let's see, indicators, SMA, I'm going to use a 20 line, I'm going to use Bollinger Bands, volume, well, MACD, and then RSI and then volume. Okay, we're not going to be able to see this too well because I have to use the yearly chart and I don't want to mess around with time frame. Uh, oh, well, let's just go ahead. Okay, so let me redraw that chart. All right, so on or around March 2nd, it's right about this time, right? March 2nd, right here, we've seen this pull back from when it hit its 20-day moving average and it was moving up in price. It was moving further above the 20-day band and look here, we also saw that the MACD line did cross back here, but it started to go above the zero line right around March 2nd. Now, it did cross over here, and that's about the time when I looked to, we locked in the gain here with the put, and then it came back up, and then it crashed. We had an earnings crash here, and at this point, when we saw the MACD cross and so forth, that's when I started looking to do the income method number five again and wrote it back up. Okay, so this isn't showing a lot of profit on this position from when I got in on March 2nd, 3135. 31.35, March 2nd, right about here to where it is today at 32-ish, 80. Okay, almost 30. We'll just call it 33. Okay, so 31.35 to 33, there have been some ups and downs, but that also allowed me, you know, with income method number nine to roll down the put to lower strikes, to lower the cost basis, take more advantage as it moves up in price as well. Okay, so based on the chart, when I compared those other ones, this is what I looked at. What were the other ones? Let's take a look here. They probably all did better because that's just my luck, Scott, and you're calling me out on it and making me prove that maybe I'm not a great stock selector. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Dean Foods was the other one I was interested in. I was interested in it back again in July. So on March 2nd, we would have gotten in right about here at 19. So I feel justified that Dean Foods wasn't the good choice. And although it didn't make a lot of money so far on GT, it's doing better performance than Dean Foods has done since I would have opened it on March 2nd. Nuance, by the way, you can see here on around, I'm sorry folks, on around March 2nd, MACD line was declining. That was one of the things that helped me decide to go to GT as opposed to Dean Foods. Nuance was on the list, N-U-A-N, and if I got in on March 2nd, 
Same thing as Dean Foods, right at about 20, and now it's trading at 14. So, but March 2nd, this one really did look good. You know, it had moved up again above the 20-day line. It was hitting the top of the Bollinger Bands. This was widening and above the zero line and gapping up. I guess I got lucky that I didn't pick Nuance because it had similar stock criteria that I used to select GT, exactly what we're seeing in Nuance. This positive sort of MACD that's moving above the zero line, and the MACD is above the signal line, and the volume's up. It had moved back up above its 20-day moving average, and it was hitting at the top of the upper Bollinger Band, but it didn't follow the same pattern that GT did. Okay. Uh, last but not least was same time frame, Agilent. Hey. Whoops. Okay, so this would have been a better one, right? <laughs> yeah, this is why. March 2nd. MACD started to gap up. It is moving above its 20-day and hitting the upper Bollinger Band. So yeah, Agilent at 38 now to 48 would have been a better trade. It, yeah, but I didn't know that. We saw already how these three stocks, Goodyear Tire, Nuance, and Agilent, all were above their 20-day moving average. They were near the top of their Bollinger Band. The MACD was breaking above it. Nuance dropped from 20 to 14. Agilent went up from 38 to 48. GT went from 31.35 down to almost 24, but came back and is now trading at 33. So yeah, Agilent would have been a stronger play on March 2nd using the criteria. I just thought GT was more volatile, which meant it was gonna have uh, more room to play with it as the stock fluctuated up and down, which worked well. Okay, worked very well. Okay, let's see, Martin left, and got a couple more questions here. Uh, but Martin did ask a question that I'm going to address here, even though he had to leave. I'm going to address it here uh, simply because um, he can view the recording later. So his question was going back to the signature tools and the market sentiment. And he wanted to know what this one was here. What was the SPY... MACD gap, okay, the SPX, I'm sorry, MACD gap. That was kind of what we just talked about and what we showed on the chart. This is showing you the range in the gap between the signal line and the MACD line, the MACD, okay? So if this the gap is wide, of course, the SPX, the MACD gap on the SPX 500, the Standard & Poor's 500, if it's wide, that might put it more into the bearish range because it's been growing and growing, expanding, expanding, and the idea has got to turn around. And if the MACD gap is low, well, then it might mean that it's poised for a run. Okay, so we take a look at the details there, and you can see the, the gap here, the, the one measure, the 1% measure of MACD gap, usually if it gets to about 3.8 or so, um, that's where the, what, it's bullish when it's about, I'm sorry, it's bullish actually when it's about 7. Yeah, when it reaches 8, that's what I meant. When it reaches 7 or 8, that's usually the bearish indicator that it would likely reverse back down, the 7 or 8% gap in the MACD lines. Um, or if it drops, and it's, it's the reverse, where the signal line is above the MACD line, it's in bearish, it's very rarely that you see it drop below 7. So that's where Ernie set the bullish and bearish fences for the gap, size of the gap, percentage size of the gap of the MACD line. Okay, that's that one. All right. So Martin will hopefully be able to check that out there. Harvey, when do you feel comfortable selling your married put after the stock rises considerably? When I've met my goals, it's as simple as that. Okay, in the blueprint and in any option strategy, if you hear me, if you sat in the office uh, for a week, five days, and you heard me during coaching sessions, and I already said it today as well when we were talking about the covered calls for Mike's question, anytime I'm looking at any strategy, I have his trading plan set up first, okay? And the trading plan is simply, what am I willing to risk and what am I looking to gain, okay? Harvey, if I'm in a position and the stock gaps up 18% in the first 10 days, which happened to a position, one of the first positions I followed Kurt in when we were, you know, partnering up and everything, and it was Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, I think in 10 days the stock gapped up 18%. Oh, I could have bulletproofed it. I could have generated income, you know, bulletproofed it by adjusting the put and selling a call against it. But the the return on the position was 18%. I think the stock gapped up 22%. The return on the position was 18%. And both Kurt and I felt, you know, Kurt did it for the Fusion subscribers and closed the trade out. And I said, yeah, I, I could try to beat that. I could stay in the trade. But when do you get 18% in 10 days? So I just closed it out, and I split the, the, that money and the profits into it into two other positions, which both ended up being a 10 and 11% return down the road, okay? 
So it ha I have no one answer for you. It matches your goals. If a stock gaps up in price and I think it's going to continue, sure, I may just stay in the position. I might just let it ride, roll up the put there, lock in some of the unrealized gain, maybe do an income method number five to capture more gain as it continues to move up. And I'm talking about once I see the stock move up four or five percent, or if it gaps up eight percent and I wasn't expecting it, then I'll probably adjust it at that time and then maybe still leave the upside open if I think it has room to run, not sell a call, not do an income method number six, just lock in some of that unrealized gain using income method number four. If it had gapped up and I see a potential to make profit on the position because I think it's going to pull back, I might use income method number 12. Or I may just sell to close the stock and leave the put open. As the stock falls, let that put to go up in price as well. Okay. All right. Um, you know, so it has to be based on your goals, okay? Uh, the goals there have to be equal to, um, you know, you, I'm sorry, you have to have the goals that match it and the gain has to match it. If your goals, let's say, you know, my married put goals are to average, um, my goal is to make maybe 1.5% per month, whether by closing, doing income methods, or seeing growth on the position without closing or doing an income method, okay, that's my goal. So in the first month, if the stock moved up 5% and I have a 3% gain, I may consider closing it at that time because I've almost doubled what I expected to make or more than likely, I'm going to keep trading that position. Okay? It's a hard question to answer because it has to be based on yours. Okay? It has to be based on what your goals are for the position going forward and for your trading plan, no matter what strategy. Not only married puts, but covered calls and other positions as well. Okay. Michael asks a fantastic question, and he says, what was your net gain on GT so far? It's a loss. <laughs> I'm going to be upfront about it. I am not fond of this position. You could say, oh, well, how can you have a loss on a stock that went up 4.8%? Okay. Let's see. Do I have a poll here that I can ask this? Let me see. Do I have a poll? Okay. All right. So let's just do it by vote. And we've got uh, one more question that's already in here from Stanley, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm just going to do this by vote. What is your biggest, those of you who have saw a webinar, have researched it, have traded it, and so forth, the biggest complaint about a married put is if the stock stagnates. The second biggest complaint is you're losing money right away, so you have to sell calls right away. And if the stock's stagnating, you have to sell calls to pay off the put. You know what got me into a loss in GT? Selling a call. I actually listened to one of my customers instead of myself. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. As someone was pointing out during a, a webinar that I should sell a call on a position. You know, the GT had been stagnating, and he was following me in the position. It was in that you know 28, 29 range, and it hadn't moved in some time. And he said you should really, uh, you know, you should consider selling a call in the position. And we did. Sold the September 30 call at one point for the 67 cents, and it kind of gapped up. And why did it gap up? Where is my stock chart here? Is this it? No, this isn't it. Let me go back two to three months. Okay. Here it is. Here's GT. Rolled down the put to about the 29 strike. And for really end of July through the beginning of September, the stock's just hovering around 29. It's not doing anything. So I got some premium here. I already rolled the put down to the 29, you know, after it fell here. So now it's coming back up, and I was going to, I think I rolled to the 30 uh, back at, it was actually at this point, okay? But that whole long stretch, the stock's not doing anything. It's just staying there. And a customer around this point said, you should just be selling the 29 calls on a weekly basis. You would have knocked that down. And I said, okay, well, let's do that then. You're in the position. I'll let you take the reins. We sold the 29 call here for 67 cents. And you know what this is? This here, this first gap, and then this second gap up to 32, this is someone at a bank saying that GT is poised to outperform all of its other uh, competitors because of its um, place in the market, its position in the market, and its savings, and its other industries. And it's he's moving it from perform to outperform, or underperform to perform, or whatever he did. Okay, so one day it's now trading at 31.50. So that's where we got 67 cents here and had to pay 250 back in. What does that mean? I just added $2 to the cost basis of my position. 
what was almost a bulletproof position is now at a $2 risk on a $30 stock, so I'm at about a 7% loss on the position. And then, you know, I thought, okay, we just got to roll the call up, so let's roll it to the 3150, and then boom, it does the 3250 jump again. Okay, so now I got to pay more to buy back this call at this time. Had I left this open, had I not sold the call at the 29 mark, had I listened more to myself, <laughs> but had I not sold the call here, this position would be at an 8.5% gain. With the income method number five position, without having sold the call and bought it back for a price and having to do it again because it gapped up again, I'd have a gain of 8.5% with the adjustments I'd done on the position. As of right now, I just sold the, I rolled the October 7th to the October 14th call. I rolled from the 32 to the 33 today. Okay, let's, uh, Let's go back here. Let's go back. There we go. Okay, so I rolled from the 32 to the 33 today with the plan to roll next week from October 14th to October 21st because I can likely cancel it. Right now, if I get assigned at 33, it's a loss of 1% where I would have had a gain of about 8.5% had I not sold the call in the first place and had to buy it back at 267, or I'm sorry, 258, 47 when I collected 67 cents for it originally because of that gap. Now, why do I bring that up? I, I say it as a gap is because there's no way I could have known that was coming. Even if I was a master chart reader and claim myself as the technical chart reading guru, you cannot predict something like that, which is why I don't like to use income method number one in the married put positions. Now, all that being said, of course, that's this position. Uh, the other ones there are, you know, other positions, of course, are actually looking pretty good. We're bulletproof on Foot Locker. Um, I'm probably going to lock that into a 9.9% .9 gain or close it for a gain there. Um, the Pro Shares is actually at break even because of the put price. Kroger is a mess, but Kroger's down 34% from when I got in. <laughs> I'm only losing about 9% on the position. But that's going to be adjusted after the earnings. And Goodyear Tire, there's that loss of 1%, but I'm going to get that back. To close to break even probably by rolling to the next uh, expiration series as well. Boston Scientific, I'm prepared for anything that happens with that one. It's about small loss right now of 2%, but we've got it in the strangle with income method number 12. So with earnings coming up in 17, 18 days, if it moves in either direction, this is going to be a profit position. Okay, And then I'm going to adjust it at that point and probably do a different income method as well. Okay, now... Sorry about that, Stanley. You were been waiting here for about 12, 14 minutes and said, is there a setup for the iron condor search so that the option spreads are equal on both sides? Uh, example, put is 80, stock is now 100, call is 120. Okay. Yes. Okay, it took me a second to remember that, Stanley. I, I know that it's there, I just forgot. There's two ways that you can actually make this easier for yourself. Okay, let's go to Iron Condor, my friend. Let's take out Bear Call Credit. I'm going to take a look at our Iron Condor. Let's add that to the menu and go ahead and save the configuration. All right. Now, in the Iron Condor search, it's a fun little thing that I'm actually very proud of because uh, I worked with the programmer, uh, one of the former programmers a while ago to set this particular filter up. So, of course, the one thing that you can do is, as you know, you can set the strikes um, to be equal. Okay, you can set the strike prices, uh, I'm sorry, the same margin on both sides of spread. I know that's not what you're asking, um, but yeah, so if uh, you're looking at a stock at 100, and you wanted to make sure that you're looking at the 120 and the 100 call, I'm sorry, and the 80, okay? Well, you'd probably want, you know, the 75 and the 125, and that's what the same strike uh, same margin on both spreads does for you. So you don't have one side of your spread that's a 10 and one that's a 5. Okay, I know that's not what you're asking, but I want to point that out for others. What we're going to use, it's called the percent out of the money range. Right? The percent out of the money range, it's not out of the money on the option. I'm sorry, it's not out of the money you know, for the option you're selling. What it's talking about is a percent out of the money range of 50 okay, shows that the stock is currently trading halfway between the short put strike and the, and the call strike. If I had a percent out of the money range of 100, that means I'm all the way up to the, at the short call strike price and the puts are very far out of the money. If I'm at zero, the puts are at the money 
and the calls are five minutes. This was designed to allow investors who wanted to skew an iron condor based on a bullish or bearish sentiment. But I use it the same way you would use it, Stanley. I identify it because I only want to see positions where the percent out of the money range is between 45 to 55. So my call and my put are about equidistant. And you could narrow that further. You could do 48 and 52. You could even do probably 49 to 51. But I leave it open. I go 45 to 55 on the percent range out of the money. Let's see what our results here give us. So here's the Lulumon at 50. Here's a good one. Let's use Alibaba. It's at 106. The short call strike is 120. Okay, so it's roughly 14 points out of the money. And the short put is the 92 and a half, which is about 14. It's 1350. Okay, so this one is the 92 and a half to 120. Uh, let's get a graphic of that there. Almost perfect, isn't it? The green line's almost perfect. Okay, right in the middle. So as I mentioned, our 92 and a half strike is 13.5 points out of the money, and then our 120 is 14 points. That's about as close as you can get it to the mid-range. So that's the filter you want to use. Percent out of the money range, I suggest starting with a range of 45 to 55, Stanley, and then you can adjust that further as you move on. And all these positions are pretty much going to be like, let's find a nice, is there a round number? Here's one, uh, SPY, right at 215. With that one, all the potential spreads we could find on it, this one is showing us a short call strikes at 225. 10 points in the money, and the short put strike is at 206. So we'd like to see the 205. It's not there, um, but we do have the 206 here. So it's pretty close, but we could, we could adjust that as well also. And the SPY 205 might be on here, this list too, somewhere else. I might have just missed it, actually. Here's one that's a 207, 224. Okay, so at 215, it's uh, nine points in the money and, uh, yeah, eight points uh, out of the money for the call. I'm sorry, nine points nine points out of the money for the call, eight points out of the money for the put. I always get confused when I talk to condors after talking about married puts because I have to think that I want to be out of the money and not in the money. And for the call side, I'm out of the money. I'm not selling a call. It's at the money and so on and so forth. Okay, but Stanley, that's what you're going to use. Percent out of the money range is going to satisfy all of your needs there for isolating those iron condors where the stock is right in that dead even point, the 50% range. Okay, and if you have any problems setting it up later, you just give me a call, send me an email, and let me know, and I'll get that handled for you. Excuse me, folks. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in, so I'm going to switch back now and just uh, wrap up here. If you do have a last-minute question, go ahead and send that in. We do still have. I can spend a little more time here with you if you want to. If there's any other questions that are out there. Okay, uh, let's see, just wanted to remind everyone, of course, not about the basic ground rules, but for those of you that joined us today, but you're currently not taking a trial and you're not a subscriber, remember you can start your 14-day free trial to Power Options at any time. Just go to powerop.com, put in first name, last name, and email address, and then click Start My Trial, okay? And that will allow you, when you click Start the Trial there, that'll allow you full access to the site for 14 days. Okay, all right. Um, okay, in addition to that, the subs... Whoa! Man, this thing's jumpy today. Sorry, folks. The uh, subscription levels, we do offer an end-of-day service, which does give you access to all the search and analysis tools, um, but you don't get the picks of the day that Ernie put together for the cover calls and the cash-secured naked puts and the search results by email, and it's not real-time. Just the end of the day, that's $40 per month. The 20 minute delayed service, you get access to all the tools plus the picks of the day and having your search results emailed to you at the time of your selecting, that's $60 per month. We do offer a historical service, 20 minute delayed plus access to our historical tools where the back testing data goes back to April of 2006, that's $100 per month. And of course the real time service is $120 per month as well. All right, so our upcoming webinar events, Wednesday, October 12th, 12 noon Eastern, I'm going to host a presentation on straddles and strangles for earnings. Was supposed to be on the 5th, was supposed to be this Wednesday, but there was a technological issue with the computer. Uh, it wasn't processing something. It was having, it was dropping internet connection for no reason. It wasn't the connection because everyone else's computer in the office was fine. It was just having a problem dropping connection. We weren't able to host the webinar from that machine. Um, so it's going to be on... Wednesday, October 12th. And of course, Friday we'll be back for another open discussion presentation as well. 
Okay, let me switch over here for Michael one last time. And uh, I'm sorry, Michael, there we go. There we go. Okay, should be back on my screen now unless it paused on us. There we go. Mike says, what is this about the performance guarantee? This is something that Ernie instituted a long time ago. And what the performance guarantee states is he, he's a trader himself. He's traded covered calls. He knows that you can have seven or eight good months in a row, and you're just going to end up with one bad month. Things just aren't going to work out the way you want. All right. So Ernie feels that if during any month you do not make at least three times your subscription amount, in other words, you're paying $60 per month, but you didn't make at least $180 per month, then you can request the guarantee and we'll give you your next month free. You know, we won't give you a refund for the current month, but we'll give you your next month free. Because we're traders as well as we know that can happen. Anything that had a 90% success rate with spreads and so forth, one month you're going to have a 5% success rate and probably wipe out your portfolio. This doesn't stop the hurting on that, but we're traders too. We know that whatever worked six months ago is likely not going to work six months down the road, or at least in the same return fashion that you're expecting. Okay, So that's the performance guarantee. All right. Now, if you request multiple guarantees in a row, in other words, if you ask for two in a row, Ernie and I are going to get involved. We're going to request that you schedule a coaching session. We're going to want to talk about what you're trading. We're going to want to talk about what you're doing as far as your stock selection. And if you know you keep requesting ones after that, what we're going to ask you is, hey, you know, this isn't working out for you. You're losing money in your portfolio more than the subscription cost is going to help you. And you know. It's not a win-win situation for either because we're not making any money uh, providing you a reasonable service. You know, Now, I don't mean it to sound like that, but I bring it up because we did have, this was an issue. The reason why Ernie and I approach it this way is we had an issue, and it was about five years ago. And there was a gentleman that swore to the high heavens that he was going to become a millionaire. In a year's time, actually, I think he had a target of eight months with $100,000. He was going to grow his account to a million dollars from $100,000, trading nothing but short strangles, where you're selling out of the money call and selling out of the money put like the other than Condor Stanley and I were just looking at, but without the extra legs. You're essentially in a naked call and a naked put. And he swore he was going to make a million dollars in eight months from a $100,000 starting point. No. What did he do? The first month, he called us up and said he didn't make any money. He had... 10 successful trades and two losers, and the two losers pushed him down to a $2,000 loss on his $100,000 account, about 2%, so he asked for a uh, guarantee. And then he asked it for the second month, and he had a $4,000 loss, and he was right 80% of the time again. He had two losses, and it you know took him down about $4,000 now. Okay, so now Ernie and I got involved, and we, you know, we wanted to say, well, look, there are better strategies you might be using. He didn't want to hear it. All he wanted to hear is how can I do better at trading these short straddles and short strangles to make a million dollars in eight months. We couldn't help him. He wouldn't listen to us. He wouldn't listen to us about going further out of the money to lower profit. He says, no, I have to make this percentage yield, and I have to make this minimum net credit. I said, well, the reason why you're losing is maybe you're not going far enough out of the money. He says, well, then I won't get the credit, so I would never open that trade. I said, okay, well, what about a probability sum to use that? I said, no, I just need this net credit and this, this, this range out of the money and this yield. That's all I need. I don't want to go beyond this range out of the money, and I want this net credit. I said, okay. Fourth month, he asked for a guarantee. Fifth month, he asked for a guarantee. Ernie called him three times that month to tell him that he shouldn't be trading anymore. He's down about 50%, by the way. His, after five months, his plan to grow his $100,000 to a million, he's down, he was down to $48,000, I think, at that point, after five months. And he wouldn't listen to us. And he kept asking for a guarantee. So eventually, he didn't request to cancel. We canceled him because we said this is a lose-lose situation. You're losing more than 50% of your portfolio value by not listening to us and not trying to change. We don't like to be a part of that. And honestly, as a business, we're not making any money off of you. And we're spending time trying to get you to do something that you're not going to do. So we're just going to request that you cancel the service. And you know, you might want to find a different service that's going to allow you to find these straddles and strangles that you're using that don't seem to be working out. And he still swore that he was going to make a million dollars in eight months. And he took a 50% loss in five months, but swore he was going to, still at the end of eight months, he was going to make a million dollars. Okay, that happens. But that's why the guarantee is there. Okay, so if you feel that you did not make at least uh, three times your subscription amount in a given month, you can call us and let us know. But we'll want to know what you were doing. You know, what kind of strategies were you doing? What happened against you? And a lot of the conversations, very rarely, by the way, do we get people who ask for the guarantee. 
But when I asked a customer who I requested a guarantee, I said, okay, well, what strategy are you trading? He said, well, I've been doing covered calls. I've been very successful. I just got into this one. And we all have our friends, and we've all started our own conversations when you say this one. What does that mean? It's that one stock that everything had the same chart. Look, we just looked at three charts there that had the same type of technical and fundamental indicators on March 2nd, GE, Agilent, and Nuance. Nuance dropped from 20 down to 14 over the same time period. GE went from 3135 up to about 3285, and Agilent went from 28 to 38. Okay, so, you know, that's just the nature of the game. Um, but that being said, we know that there's that one stock. That one stock might have been nuanced, but it might have happened overnight. No one saw it coming. It was something you could not predict, something you couldn't see in a chart, something that was not in the news. You could have done all your due diligence, but they just come out and say, oh, by the way, we've lied for the last four months, uh, I'm sorry, last four seasons for earnings. We've actually been losing money. Boom, stock drops 35%. doesn't happen often, but it happens more frequently than you think. In general, it happens to every investor, I'd say about every eight months or so, eight to nine months. It's just my experience, okay? And if you haven't had that experience yet, great, but make sure you protect yourself because you don't want to have that experience. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in today, folks. That was the last one there. And um, if you do think of any questions anytime, send us an email to support at powerup.com. Uh, you can also send us questions about radioactive trading to support at radioactivetrading.com or you can call the office during market hours. You can reach at 302-992-7971 when the market's open as well. And remember that you trial members and subscribers, you can schedule a coaching session. Uh, real quick, one last question Michael did follow up with that. He said, are ETFs any better? Single ETFs, SPY, QQQ, IWM, probably won't see that kind of movement and decline. Okay, you won't see the kind of 20%. If you see a 20% decrease overnight in the SPY, then we have bigger concerns than what just happened to our positions. Yeah, we don't want that to happen to our position. Something big outside the realm of investing has happened for the SPY to drop 20% overnight, and we don't even want to think about what it would be, okay? So yes, well, are they better as far as a protection range goes and not having those gaps down? Absolutely. You don't have any fear of earnings with an ETF. Now, it can drop consistently if a whole sector, let's say the technology sector, has all has poor earnings this year, like a lot of the big technology companies have poor earnings this season, we will see QQQ and the NDX decline because of that. But it won't be a sudden gap down and a sudden gap down, right? It won't be a 15% gap down one day and then a 20% gap down the other. You can't have that with a stock. Earnings or any other events that come out or just unexpected events like I mentioned can come out and that can cause the stock to decline. But it's trade-off, Michael. You like to trade stocks on either covered calls or the type of spreads you're looking at. Uh, maybe even married puts, for example, because you want some volatility, you want the movement, you want a good call premium. You trade the ETFs that I mentioned, the single standard ETFs, okay? What do I mean by that? No two times, no three times bull or bear. Those are just as volatile as stocks, and they can swing widely. Um, uh, Martin had to come in with a question earlier about JNUG, okay? And, you know, that was one of the, the I can't remember, honestly, if it was a bull or bear, um, Oh, this is the bull three times ETF, okay? The Gold Miners Junior uh, three times movement ETF. You realize that was at $30 a month ago? And you do realize it was at $20 beginning of October. Seven days later, it's 50% of its value from where it was at the beginning of October, okay? Because it was a bull ETF and it's three times. Standard uh, ones there. Yeah, and then, oh, okay, thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. What happened to me with SH? This is something that can happen with these two or three times ETFs and even the standard ETFs. You can get those reverse splits from time to time. The leveraged ETFs, the two times and three times, in order to properly track um, their underlying or track the three times or four times, you can get those reverse splits that we talked about earlier that can be a pain, which is what I'm in with SH right now. Okay, the shorthanded, or the inverse, I'm sorry, SPY. Okay. <laughs> Hockey season starting, so shorthanded is on my mind at power plays and things of that nature. And I know baseball is wrapping up right now and everyone's in the swing of football, but I am a hockey fan. So, all right. Um, yeah, so reverse splits. Thank you, Scott. That is another thing to watch out for with some of these different types of uh, obscure ETFs. So, Michael, is it safer using ETFs? Yes, but the standard ETFs, again, SPY, QQQ, uh, IWM, which has more volatility than the other two, but it's, it's still more stable. 
Um, there's, there's other ones out there too, the uh, oil ETF, but that is sector driven, remember, and every, when you saw that big decline in oil Thanksgiving, right, November 2015, I remember it was the, my in-law's house in Virginia, and my father-in-law sort of said, so are you in oil? And I said, no, why? And I just woken up, and I just <laughs> got my daughter uh, some breakfast, and I came up to see what he was doing, and I just see oil is just thrashed. It is, it is just crashing ridiculously on this one-day drop. So the oil ETF was hit really hard. I think it's USO is the oil ETF, or, or OIH, OIH, and it was hit really hard. Didn't expect it, but, you know, the gold ETF is based on that, too. All the bullish, any of the standard golds took a hit, not a 50% hit like the three times did, but they took a significant hit the other day. So is it safer? Yes. Are you going to get the premiums that you're expecting and the same returns? No, because the volatility of those those big standard ETFs, you're talking about 0.1 or what you'd call 10% or 0.14 or 14%. Whereas standard stock, you might be around 0 0.25, 0 0.3, 25 or 30 percent volatility and implied volatility range. You're a third of that on the standard ETFs. So there's not a lot of premium. Okay. All right. So that about sums that part up. As far as uh, are the ETFs better? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, none, they're not. You know, they're, they're, it's a trade-off. Is, is what I mean to say. You won't have the fear of those kind of sudden gaps down, but you won't get the returns that you were expecting at the same time either. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, that's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you for joining me, and thank you for your questions. We'll get this archive posted maybe sometime this weekend or on Monday morning, and we'll let you know when today's webinar is posted to the archives. Uh, take care, everyone. Have a fantastic evening. Have a fantastic weekend. We'll see you soon. Good night.